a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and uh, welcome to a new video from Jogler66 from Hour of the Truth. This has been quite a day, I can tell you. You know, I did um, the two in the inaugurational videos before I wanted to start reading the book from Luther's Works, Volume 41. And in that, of course, not the whole book, as I told you, but the letter pages, the book that is called Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil. And I did my two videos as the introduction before I wanted to start that book. And then today I got the idea, I don't know why, <laughs> just to try to do a little research and see. Well, you know, I got this complete book in German as a book in itself. And I only have it included in Luther's works, volume 41, Church and Ministry. And there it is the last part. In the beginning, this book goes about other things. And i probably read that also. It goes about um, uh, on the councils and the church in 1539. Then it goes against Hans Wurst for 1541. And then against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil, 1545. And altogether... <clears throat> this book has a little bit more than uh, 300 and well, no, I'm going to take out uh, the index without the index it has 376 pages and against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil is from 263 to 376 so that's only about uh, 113 pages something like that and my German edition was 86 pages, so yeah, there's another print and it's German. This has more footnotes and is interesting. But let me come to the point. Uh, I wanted to do a little research and see if uh, this book is to be found as a sole book. Huh? Uh, I, I didn't find that. I thought, yeah, because, you know, I wanted to have an image for when I read this, uh, to put an image of that book in the video. Otherwise, I can only use the German one. Well, I didn't even come to that. I Google searched about Martin Luther and the Antichrist and I fell or I stumbled upon a paper um, that was written by a Seventh-day Adventist. And you know what I think of Seventh-day Adventists, okay? I think they are... I know they are founded by Freemasons, they are controlled by Jesuits, and they are a diabolic, diabolical sect of quote-unquote Christianity, because real Christianity is not diabolical. But anyway, I fell about this paper and I thought, well, you know, I put my German readings into this playlist called Luther 2017, and I will probably put these videos also in the same playlist. So then you have to see, of course, there are many German-speaking videos in there. And these will be the very first um, English-spoken videos in that, in that playlist. But uh, I started this playlist um, about a year ago, where I analyzed a paper from the Seventh-day Adventists uh, about 500 years of Reformation. And that paper has about 40 pages, as far as I remember right now. I don't have it in front of me. It doesn't matter. I have it on the computer. And um, I analyzed that paper. I threw out all the false uh, SDA doctrine. And uh, then I did seven readings, and comment, uh, seven readings with my comment on that for a little more than seven hours. And that's the basis of this playlist, Luther... Tw uh, Luther uh, Luther 2017, yeah, that's what it's called, Luther 2017. 
so my point is, I, I stumbled out today about uh, about this paper, which is a journal of the Adventist Theological Society from spring 2007. And um, I thought, well, I should read this. Because, you know, you have to eat the meat and spit out the bones. So I wanted to see if this article, which is about 20 pages in a PDF, has some meat. Or is it just bones? And I can tell you, it is all meat. This paper has nothing, nothing, not one word of Seventh-day Adventist doctrine in it. It is completely biblical. And it gives us a nice, how can I say that? A nice journey to understand how Luther, during his life as a Protestant, actually as the Protestant, <laughs> like the Antichrist, huh? <laughs> how he came to the understanding that the papacy is the Antichrist. Now, I did this first two inaugural videos, uh, Truth and History. I read that to you, and I read to you the introduction of the, uh, of the book of Luther's works, the introduction of and uh, to the against the Roman papacy and I wanted to start with that reading today but now I see it is much better that I will first start with this little pamphlet I call it that is written in 2007 from someone from the Southern Adventist University in the United States of America and I don't care that he is or was a Seventh-day Adventist the only thing that I care about is the truth. By their fruits you will know them. And this work is the absolute truth. And it is wonderfully historically based. When you read it for yourself, you can read all the sources that it is in there. This is written like a story. And that's what makes it so interesting for me to read to you. But it is actually a bibliography of Luther's way between the time of before 1517 even until the time of his death because we know against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil was Luther's last work that book was published the same day the Council of Trent started in 50, 25th of March 1545 and Luther died in I thought it was February or March the next uh, next year. So I really want to read to you this PDF, and it's I told you it's 20 pages, and of course here and there I will probably make some comment, even though I didn't prepare that. I just read through the paper to know what it's about and see if it is worth reading, and it is. But uh, here and there I will make comments, so I don't know if this is only the first of, again, more than one video or so. Let's see where it takes us, but uh, I think in commemoration commemoration of the 500 years anniversary of Luther nailing his teeth to the church door in Wittenberg, or the castle door in Wittenberg, or even not nailing them, but just publishing them in Latin and then later in German all over Europe, against the indulgences is a very, very interesting thing. And of course, we can expand from this paper that I'm reading here into much, much more. Like, and that's also what I will do, uh, extend to explain the bull of excommunication Pope Leo X uh, gave to Luther. We are going to read that too, because I found that also on the internet. And I think, I think, I love history, you know that. That's why I read these old books, and I learn with them all the time. All the time. I'm still in the learning process, and the day that I say I know it all, you, you know that I'm lying. I'm in the learning process, and I love this learning process. And I love to see that what I read here in this paper, I have had already confirmation in other books, and other pamphlets, and other documents, so I know that what I read here is true. And that makes it so wonderful. Now I made an introduction of nine minutes <laughs> and you know that I will put this video no, no, out no longer than having one hour in total because the attention span is already then very much stressed when you are 
able to listen one hour to a video of mine. I know that. I know that, but you know, it took me hours to read through that paper and examine it and, 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 and analyze it and understand it. So I'm just asking you one hour of your time to get acquainted with what I'm reading to you right now. And I also want to ask you for your understanding that I will not do fancy video work, but that it is the written word that for me is important. And for that, that I will not use exactly the right picture at the right time when I say something like in many other videos or other readings. So in this case, uh, I want to apologize for the video work, but uh, you have to understand it's about the spoken word and not about the pictures. So we have come to 10 minutes introduction and I'm going to read to you Martin Luther's views on the Antichrist. In the warm ecumenical afterglow of Vatican II, you know, that council that took place between 1962 and 1965, that was the ecumenical afterglow, yeah, the ecumenical uh, council that sought to find a reconciliation between all the different Protestant denominations and the Roman Catholic Church. In the warm ecumenical afterglow of Vatican II, Martin Luther's identification of the papacy as the Antichrist of Bible prophecy is often seen as narrow-minded, bigoted, and even unchristian. <laughs> yeah, Martin Luther's view of the papacy as being the Antichrist of Bible prophecy is narrow-minded, bigoted, and it is even a probably terroristic view because it is not politically correct let me tell you that but anyway his view which until recently was shared by a broad spectrum of conservative evangelical protestants is now seen as an embarrassment by some members of churches that retain this interpretation it is no longer socially acceptable to describe the papacy as the fulfillment of a collection of prophecies regarding a powerful spiritual tyranny. Even the United States Congress has put itself on record regarding this issue. In the year 2000, Congress passed a joint resolution condemning Bob Jones University for promoting this belief. You can read that in uh, the 106th Congress, second session, uh, from February 29th, 2000, and there's a link here um, that leads to the Internet Library of the Congress, and there you can look that up for yourself. It is politically incorrect. That's what it is. Uh, Eric Arthur Blair who you probably better know as um, George Orwell, once said, the farther a society drifts from the truth, the more it hates them who speak about it. And that's the times that we are living in. The truth has never been popular, but it becomes more and more dangerous to speak it, until it becomes even very dangerous to even think it. Now anyway, we continue here. The politicians who passed that resolution were probably unaware that they were undermining the historical foundations of Protestantism. But this is the logical interference one can make from this significant observation by Professor Philip Carey of Eastern University. Quote, the Reformation wouldn't have happened without the conviction that the Pope was the Antichrist. Unquote. <laughs> Now, there are several things that I have to say to the sentence. The politicians who passed that resolution were probably unaware that they were undermining the historical foundations of Protestantism, the author says here. You know, I, and I guess you also, because when you follow my channel, you, you follow my channel and you watch what I do, we read Rulers of Evil. In the very first chapter of the book of Rulers of Evil, we see among the Holy Alliance, how the Senate of the United States of America and the Congress of the United States of America is run by Catholics, not Protestants. So the politicians who passed that resolution were all of Catholic belief, and of course they were 
undermining the historical foundations of Protestantism. I just do not, I'm not just sure that they were unaware of it. I think they're very, very much, very much aware of it. But people like also the author of this book are probably not aware of that all the ruling people and all the ruling institutions in the United States of America are run by Roman Catholics. Like, for example, your Supreme Court. At least six Roman Catholics and three Jews, not one Protestant on there. And I think four or five people are even members of Opus Dei. Look that up for yourself. Yeah? The politicians who passed that resolution were probably unaware that they were undermining the historical foundations of Protestantism. No, they were not probably unaware. They were very much aware of it because there are no Protestants. They were Roman Catholics. But still, the author says, this logical interference one can make from this significant observation. So here comes the quote now of Philip Carey from the Eastern University. Quote, the Reformation wouldn't have happened without the conviction that the Pope was Antichrist. Okay. The Reformation wouldn't have happened without the conviction that the Pope was the Antichrist. What Reformation, I ask you? Where has the Roman Catholic Church ever been reformed? Where has the Roman Catholic Church ever changed? Rome does not change. The Antichrist does not change. The Roman Catholic Church, semper eadem, always the same, does not change. Reformation wouldn't have happened without the conviction that the Pope was the Antichrist, yes, but the Reformation was not reforming the Roman Catholic Church. The quote-unquote Reformation was bringing forth Protestants. With the Augsburg Confession in 1530, 1529, 1530, the term Protestant was formed. And all of a sudden you had Protestants. You didn't have Reformers, because the more the people went away and saw the Roman Catholic Church for the cesspool of hell that it really is, they all knew that that church is unreformable, is irreformable. The Reformation wouldn't have happened without the conviction that the Pope was the Antichrist? Yes, I agree in that sense that the people who came out of the Roman Catholic Church, starting with, like I said in my very first video, um, Wycliffe and then Huss and um, Tyndale, that these persons also all identified the Pope as the Antichrist. And that is the basis for this quote-unquote Reformation, which never took place. The Reformation never took place. We are now, today, the 10th of October 2017. It's only 21 days until the 31st of October, Reformation Day, when 500 years ago Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg, and the Roman Catholic Church has not changed this last 500 years. No, but as we know from the paper that I read to you from communion to uh, from conflict to communion, they say it is not to to uh, explain or, or or speak about history uh, to explain a different history, but explain the history in different words. That's what they do. That's what the Roman Catholic Church has done from the beginning, from the very moment, from the very start. It has been a lying, cheating, mis uh, cheating, idolatrous, superstitious religion from the beginning, using casuistry and sophistry and never ever telling the truth. Not once. The Reformation wouldn't have happened without the conviction that the Pope was the Antichrist? Okay, in that regard, that we understand that when you come to the conviction that the Pope is the Antichrist, you come to reform yourself in that way that you get out of that church. Run! Run! And don't look back! The conviction that the Pope was the Antichrist is the pillar of Protestantism, the absolute pillar of Protestantism. 
the biblical and historical understanding that the papacy and only the papacy is the antichrist of the bible is the pillar of protestantism and when you take that pillar away protestantism is dead and on that i'm going to read to you another article not today but i'm going to read to you vatican fake news the reformation is over a newsletter from richard bennett i will read that in the future to you i was planning that already with this paper here but now this paper came in between i had so many things that come in between my plans but anyway the message still is the same the papacy is the antichrist is the pillar of protestantism and when you take that pillar away protestantism is dead and when protestantism is dead rome has won and how come that protestantism today is dead or almost dead on his last breath on his last breath because of ecumenism and this article starts within the warm ecumenical afterglow of vatican II, and so on and so on and how was this ecumenical council possible in the first place well only because the people do not know anymore that the papacy is the antichrist because instead of reading the bible and understanding god's word they read roman catholic publications of francisco ribera and cardinal bellarmine and as 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 raben what's his name lacunza there all these uh, forged bibles like the schofield bible which lead to the understanding that Daniel 70 is weak is not completely fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2000 years ago and by that there must be a future antichrist that's what the people follow today instead of scripture and our cry must be sola scriptura the bible and the bible alone there is everything in that we need to know but when the people go away from the from the scripture yeah then of course it's easy to fall into apostasy and then it is easier to understand that the papacy is the antichrist and when the papacy is not the antichrist then he is god on earth you can have it the one way or the other but you cannot have it both ways that's also a conclusion that you come to when you read against the roman papacy and institution of the devil from martin luther we're going to read in the future If the Pope is not the Antichrist, then the Pope is God on earth. There is no in between. It's the one or the other. The question is do you believe the Bible who tells you that he is not God on earth, that he is the quote unquote vicar of Satan instead of the vicar of Christ as he calls himself? Or do you believe him when he says outside of the Roman Catholic Church there is no salvation? as the bull unan sanctum from pope innocent the third said in 1302 it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the roman pontiff do you believe that or do you believe scripture scripture which tells you that historically biblically historically and prophetically there's one antichrist and that is the office of the papacy from the beginning from the very first pope to the actual at this moment reigning pope francis until the very last one whoever he may be how many there ever will come until christ returns but when you take away the pillar of the foundation of protestantism that the papacy is the antichrist you have no protest anymore that's true and that's what we should all be aware of and that's what we all should shout from the rooftops and produce videos and articles and everything what whatever we can every day to shout this truth from the rooftops the papacy is the antichrist and that's the pillar of protestantism not the pillar of the reformation because the reformation never took place because the roman catholic church never ever changed never ever sempre adam always the same but let's go back to the article 
since this conviction that we just read, the quote-unquote reformation wouldn't have happened without the conviction that the Pope was the Antichrist, since this conviction is one that most contemporary Protestants have dis discarded today, this professor, Philip Carey, who describes himself as an, quote, ecumenical-minded Protestant, challenges his fellow Protestants, quote, if the Pope isn't the Antichrist, what right do you have to be split? Unquote. <laughs> if the Pope is not the Antichrist, you have no right to split because then he impersonates the body of Christ, he and his church. But we know that Rome is of Babylon and not of Christ. But the question that this professor asks here is legit. If the Pope isn't the Antichrist, what right do you have to be split? Well, if you're a biblical Christian, none. But because you are a biblical Christian, you know that the Pope is the Antichrist, and therefore you have every right to split. If Protestantism owes its very existence to Luther's conviction that the papacy was the Antichrist and still is the Antichrist, it might be instructive to inquire why Luther held this view and under what circumstances he came to this conclusion. That's what this paper is all about. We will see that he came to this view slowly and reluctantly driven by historical circumstances and theological reflection. We will also briefly note the comparable views of other Protestant reformers and their predecessors. Looking at the idea that the papacy is the Antichrist of prophecy in its historical context might give us a rational basis for evaluating it. We will focus primarily on Luther, because it was his views on the subject that triggered the Protestant Reformation. <laughs> Bravo! I couldn't have said it better. Luther was the one who put the Protestantism on this earth, who put the quote-unquote Reformation in turbo... Uh, how do you say that? in turbo gear after what happened before with Wycliffe and Huss and Tyndale and all that stuff and others of course the Waldenses, the Albigenses, the Lollards and so on it was Luther's views that triggered the Protestant Reformation that's true because of Luther's stance in Worms in 1521 which we come to later and because of his translation of the Bible into the quote-unquote vulgar tongue, the tongue of John Doe, the tongue of the man on the street, that everybody could read the Bible for themselves and start building a relationship, a personal relationship with his Savior Jesus Christ, that fact is the trigger of Protestantism. However, we should note that Luther was far from the first person to hold this view. <laughs> Do you know who was one of the first persons, I don't even say the first, but who was one of the first persons who saw the papacy as the Antichrist? Give you a little tip. It's in the Old Testament. It's one of the most wonderful prophets you have ever heard of. Daniel. He maybe didn't understand it that way. But he was the one who prophesied the Antichrist for the very first time with a little horn in Daniel 7. And we come to that later in this reading. We should note that Luther was far from the first person to hold this view. Yeah, every Bible-believing Christian before Luther held this view. The problem was 
there were not so many Bibles. And because there were not so many Bibles, there were not so many people who had them and understood them and read them and believed them and could understand that the papacy was the Antichrist. But there were people before. Luther himself credited John Huss with being the first to call the Pope an Antichrist. Huss did indeed consider the Pope to be the Antichrist, but he was not the first to do so, nor was his mentor, John Wycliffe. Although Wycliffe, and at least some of his Lollard followers, including Sir John Oldcastle, held this belief. This idea that the papacy is the Antichrist also circulated among the Waldensians, the Albigensians and the Fraticelli, a group of Franciscans with more regard for the rule of St. Francis than for papal authority. That was also something new for me, that a part of the Franciscan order also regarded the papacy as the Antichrist. I didn't know that before. I knew that, of course, of the Waldensians and of the Albigensians. That's why we should absolutely read these historical works on the Waldenses and the Albigenses, like the history of Protestantism from uh, James Edgar Wiley and other works, and Fox's Book of Martyrs, and what I'm reading now for the moment in English, History of the Inquisition by Philip from Limborg, and what I'm reading in German, um, History of the Inquisition in the Middle Ages by Henry Charles Lear. When we read those books, we understand that the Waldensians and Albigensians, people who lived there for more than thousand, year, thousand years in the south of France and north of Italy, in the Piemont and in the valley region of the, of the Alps, that they all identified the papacy as the Antichrist. But even earlier than that, Back in 991, Bishop Arnulf of Orléans, describing papal murder, lust and intrigue, asked, quote, Are there any bold enough to maintain that the priests of the Lord over all the world are to take their law from monsters of guilt like these? Unquote. When a person so deficient in virtue sits on the papal throne, Arnulf suggested that he must, quote, be the Antichrist, sitting in the temple of God and showing himself as God, as we can read in the uh, book of Thessalonians, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see, there's a little footnote here. And we can go into that uh, book note because there's also this book from Philip Schaff, History of the Christian Church, uh, eight volumes i can advise you to read that but that's thousands of pages i have that as pdf on my computer um, several other people had identified specific popes as antichrist these included holy roman empire frederick the second and his advisor eberhard the second archbishop of salzburg as well as the dominican monk girolamo savonarola and that is something that we can read in Froome's work and um, very interesting that we speak of uh, Girolamo Savonarola because he comes a little, little, little bit later on also. And I can only advise you to do your own research on things like this a little bit and uh, learn of uh, Savonarola and his story. So the article continues here. Martin Luther was probably unaware of the previous attacks on the papacy when, in 1517, he drafted his 95 Theses. Yeah, because you have to understand that when Luther drafted and nailed his 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg, he was not of the understanding yet that the papacy is the Antichrist. If he had been, he would have been unsympathetic. At the time, he regarded John Huss as a heretic. Martin Luther regarded John Huss as a heretic at the time of 1517. We have to understand that. We are reading about the journey that Luther was going all along in his life to come 
to a deeper biblical understanding that doesn't come from one day to another. That takes time. Luther's target was not the papacy. It was a greedy Dominican monk named Johann Tetzel, who was distorting Catholic doctrine by exaggerating the benefits of indulgences. Luther had no intention of splitting the church at that time. He was only trying to protect his parishioners. Well, for Tetzel, you have to understand that Pope Leo X at that time, who was reigning at that time, wanted to build St. Peter's Cathedral. What you see today when you go to the Vatican as St. Peter's Cathedral, the dome, that capital there, a temple of Jupiter, of course, that was built with all the money that Johann Tetzel and other Dominican and other monks got of all the people in Europe by selling indulgences, meaning selling them the forgiveness of sins. That is simony that I spoke about earlier. Luther had no intention of splitting the church, he was only trying to protect his parishioners from Johann Tetzel, who was distorting Catholic doctrine by exaggerating the benefits of the indulgences. Enraged, Tetzel made sure that Rome knew what was happening. That cry baby! He went to Rome, meh, 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 this Martin Luther is against my indulgences. He stirs up the people and they don't want to buy the forgiveness of sins from me anymore. This set in motion a chain of events that led to a summons for Luther to appear before a papal representative. It also led to a theological attack on Luther's position by Sylvester Cardinal Prierias, the papal court's chief theologian. Prierias wrote, quote, He who does not accept the doctrine of the Church of Rome and Pontiff of Rome as an infallible rule of faith, from which the Holy Scriptures too draw their strength, is a heretic. Now, that's a nice sentence, don't you think? Shall I read that again? Yeah? He who does not accept the doctrine of the Church of Rome and Pontiff of Rome as an infallible rule of faith, from which the Holy Scriptures too draw their strength, is a heretic. In the biblical sense, Everybody who does not believe the Bible, who does not believe the doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is a heretic. But the Roman Catholic Church, of course, has their own explanation of who a heretic is. And this is a wonderful sentence that very explicitly says that. No doubt. And the most interesting thing, I think, is when, when it comes to as an infallible rule of faith. We are speaking about people the 1600s. I mean, the 16th century, the 1500s. We are speaking about the time even before 1520. And we are speaking about an infallible Pope. The dogma of infallibility of the Pope was introduced into the Roman Catholic Church as official dogma in 1870 at the First Vatican Council, but it was official Roman Catholic politic from the beginning, from the very start. He who does not accept the doctrine of the Church of Rome and Pontiff of Rome as an infallible rule of faith, from which the Holy Scriptures too draw their strength, is a heretic. Unquote. So instead that the church draws her power from the Holy Scriptures, in Rome it is just the other way. The Holy Scriptures get their power from the church. Do you see how Satan twists the truth always exactly 180 degrees around? 
Furthermore, Cardinal Prierius says, quote, Whoever says that the Church of Rome may not do what it is actually doing in the matter of indulgences is a heretic. Unquote. <laughs> so when you say that selling indulgences, selling the forgiveness of sins is something the Roman Catholic Church may not do, then you are a heretic. Whoever says that the Church of Rome may not do what it is actually doing in the matter of indulgences is a heretic. Rome is everything and everything else is nothing. That's what Cardinal Prierius, Prierius says here. Prierius had transformed the debate from a question of procedure to a question of authority. That's it. He had transformed the question of a procedure to a one of authority. Responding to the papal summons, Luther traveled to Augsburg to appear before a papal legate, Cardinal Thomas Kajetan, who demanded that Luther recant. When Luther asked for scriptural reasons to do so, none were given him. Rome had ordered that Luther be arrested if he refused to recant, but Luther, mindful of the fate of John Huss, avoided arrest by stealing away from Augsburg on the night of October 16, 1518. Now, John Huss, I think, I don't know if that is something that I mentioned already in the last uh, chapter, in, in the last uh, video, because I was reading about Huss there. But John Huss was uh, summoned to the Council of Constance in 1514, and he was promised um, a safe trip. He was promised security. But he was executed there. The Pope lied. Uh, he used um, mental reservation. <laughs> but Martin Luther was, faith, was mindful of the fate of John Huss. And therefore he stealed away from Augsburg on the night of October 16, 15. 18, because if he stayed there longer, they would have gotten to him at that time. Now, Luther had read Priarius' assertions of papal infallibility and had experienced Cajetan's reliance on tradition, refusal to discuss scriptures, and implicit threats of force. Now he began to consider the possibility that these men might be serving Antichrist. <laughs> Why? Now he began to consider the possibility these men might be serving Antichrist because by their fruits you will know them. On December 18, 1518, he wrote to Wenceslaus Link, soon to replace Stepnitz as the head of the Augustinian order in Germany, you know, Luther was an Augustinian monk, asking him to evaluate on the basis of some of his writings whether he was right in his suspicion, quote, that the true Antichrist mentioned by St. Paul reigns in the court of Rome, unquote. A few months later, Luther wrote to his friend and former student, George Spalatin, chaplain and secretary to Elector Frederick of Saxony, telling him that he had been studying papal decretals in preparation for the upcoming disputation at Leipzig. He added, quote, Confidentially, I do not know whether the Pope is Antichrist himself or his apostle. So miserably is Christ, that is, the truth, corrupted and crucified by the Pope in the decretals. Unquote. Let me read that again. Confidentially, I do not know whether the Pope is Antichrist himself or his apostle. So miserably is Christ corrupted and crucified by the Pope in the Decretals. When you read Papal Decretals, when you read Papal Bulls, when you read Papal Encyclicals, you find everything in there but one thing, and that's Jesus Christ. 
I do not know whether the Pope is the Antichrist himself or his apostle, but when I look at his writings and see how Christ is corrupted and crucified by the Pope and his decretals, I have my suspicions, would Luther say in other words. In July 1519, at the Leipzig debate with Johann Eck, for which Luther had been preparing, Luther took the position that both popes and church councils could err. Now, this little sentence is quite interesting, because when we go into the book Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil that Luther wrote in 1545, he makes mentioning of that debate with Johann Eck in 1519. Okay? So, we see it all coming together, because here is someone who writes over Luther, and I can confirm this, because this debate that the author here is mentioning in this paper, Luther actually himself writes of in his own book against the Roman papacy. This is called cross-reference study. This is called checking your sources and checking if something is the truth. Just a little advice for all you out there who also want to do their own research, as I always promote to do. Now, for Luther, everything stood under the judgment of Scripture. He would soon be using Scripture to pass judgment on the Pope. Two things that Luther read the following year weakened his hesitation about calling the Pope Antichrist. <laughs> Two things that Luther read the following year weakened his hesitation about calling the Pope the Antichrist. It didn't weaken his conviction just his hesitation about calling was weakened so he more freely spoke out he more freely called the pope the antichrist first in february of 1520 he read lorenzo valla's demonstration that the donation of constantine the basis for rome's claim to supremacy over the western world was a forgery and we read of this also in his book against the Roman papacy. And Lorenzo Valla's work that finds out that the donation of Constantine and the decretals of Isidore are forged is something that you can also find in the book A Woman Rides a Beast from Dave Hunt. And uh, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update spoke about that when he read that book, and I think also in other videos he mentions that, the donation of Constantine is a joke. It's a forgery. But still the Roman Catholic Church accepts that as their basis for temporal power. And there you can see how lying and conniving the Roman Catholic Church is. Because on the one hand they rely on Matthew 16, that the two keys have been given to the Pope for spiritual and temporal power. The two keys that actually were promised, not given, but promised to Peter in the Bible. And the Pope says, that's mine. He builds his lie on that, and on the other hand, he builds his lie on the donation of Constantine. When Emperor Constantine so-called gave temporal power to the Bishop of Rome at that time. Because we know that at that time it was the Bishop of Rome, it was not a Pope. No? They were all Bishops of Rome. But that's something that we understand when we go to the book against the Roman Papacy and we come to the historical e events of uh, the years 606 through 609 and uh, Emperor Phocas and uh, Pope Innocent III. Or Boniface the third I don't know one of the two I don't remember that name exactly right now but we will see to it when we get to it 606 and focus then you can you can focus on that <laughs> focus F uh, P H O K uh, P H O C A S Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire at that time you can study maybe a little bit in advance before we come to that but Martin Luther read in 1520 Lorenzo Vella's demonstration that the donation of Constantine was a forgery. 
and this seems to have inspired another letter to Spalatin. In February 24th of 1520, where he says, quote, I am practically cornered and can hardly doubt any more that the Pope really is the Antichrist, because everything so exactly corresponds to his life, his action, his words and commandments. By their fruits you will know them, and Luther all of a sudden got his eyes wide open and saw that the papacy is the Antichrist. I am practically cornered and can hardly doubt any more that the Pope is really the Antichrist. You know, all these arguments, all this, his, the life of the popes, the actions the Pope takes, the words that the Pope speaks, the commandment that he speaks out, all this corners me, means it puts me with the back and to, uh, against the wall, and I have no defense against any argument anymore that the Pope really must be the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. This is what Martin Luther says here. I am practically cornered and can hardly doubt anymore that the Pope really is the Antichrist, because everything so exactly corresponds to his life, to his action, to his words and to his commandments. Now, after reading Vallas' treatise, Luther, hesitantly at first, began to publicly say what he had previously written privately to friends. Augustine Altfeld was a monk in Leipzig who asserted that the Bible supported total papal control of the Church and that submission to the Pope was essential for the operation of an effective government. Luther responded early in 1520 with On the Papacy in Rome against the famous Romanist at Leipzig. This publication mentioned several reasons for possibly considering Rome to be the Antichrist. Quote, it is said that the Antichrist shall find the treasures of the earth, Luther wrote, suggesting that the insufferable Roman thieves were finding their treasure by exploiting the Germans and quoting what he said was a Roman proverb, quote, squeeze the gold from the German fools, in any way you can." Unquote. <laughs> now, do you see, when this Roman proverb is true, do you see this long life struggle Rome has with Germans? Do you understand why German was the boo-boo man of World War I, that Germany was the boo-boo man of World War II? When you understand that this Roman proverb exists and probably the popes live for that, they squeeze the gold from the German fools in any way you can. A very, very interesting sentence for me to understand. Don't forget, I have some German roots. <laughs> you know, I'm not patriotic about any country in this Antichrist system, but I cannot deny my roots. And it hurts a little bit to read that a Roman proverb is this. Because when you read this Roman proverb, squeeze the gold from German fools in any way you can, then you understand what happened in history to your folks, to your people, to your country that you grew up in. And you understand why your culture, your history and everything else is crushed. When you read proverbs like this, you gain historical understanding. Now Luther then praised the issue of papal infallibility. Uh, sorry, Luther then raised the issue of papal infallibility, expressing a willingness to accept anything the Pope decreed after first testing it by the Bible. He contrasted this position with that of Roman knaves who placed the Pope above Christ and made him, quote, a judge over the scriptures, unquote, and said that he was infallible. If the Pope expected Christians to place their faith in something visible, means himself, rather than that which was invisible, that is Christ, Luther concluded, quote, I would say right out, that he is the real Antichrist. 
notice that in neither of these statements did Luther directly say that either the Pope or the Papacy was the Antichrist, but he raised the possibility. Luther is going to gain understanding with every more day he experiences. The second thing that Luther read in 1520 that weakened his hesitancy to openly declare that the Pope was Antichrist was Prierius' second treatise against Luther's teaching. Reprising his earlier arguments that the Pope had more authority than either scriptures or church councils, Prierius quoted a passage of canon law that just horrified Luther. The Pope could not be deposed from office, even if he were so scandalously bad that he led multitudes of souls to the devil. Shocked at this extreme statement from Rome's chief theologian, Luther wrote to Spalatin, I think everyone in Rome has gone crazy. And this led to Luther's writings of 1520, among others, an address to the Christian nobility. And this is something that I spoke about in Hour of the Truth some time ago. I think two or three broadcasts that you can find in the archive of Hour of the Truth in the playlist, where I read an address to the Christian nobility from Luther, Martin Luther in 1520. Now, when this video here comes out, you will have time to go to the archives of Hour of the Truth, look these up, and read this address to the Christian nobility for yourselves when you want to listen to my voice. Or you can go to the playlist of First Amendment Radio that you will find on YouTube also, where earlier this year, uh, Luther in his own words, that playlist was started, and I guess that playlist is even uh, given to you in the description box of this video, so you can look it easily, uh, easily up for yourself. Uh, Luther in, uh, Martin Luther in his own words, it's called, and the very first broadcast, I think it's only two broadcasts, that Tom spends on uh, this address, um, the uh, Christian nobility. I think he does that in about two hours. So, a little preparedness work for yourself to do your own study and to check and control your own sources and my sources and see if that's true what I told you here and then we come back next time where we will continue reading on the top of page 6 of this 20 pages document uh, yeah I thought so I couldn't read that in one hour <laughs> I know myself <laughs> anyway but we are going to learn much, much more about Martin Luther and we're going to learn much, much more about his journey on how he, come, how he came to the absolute 100% biblical conviction that the papacy was the Antichrist. And I'm not going to spoil it for you, but I can tell you he also refers to Daniel 9.27. So by this, thank you very much for watching, listening and commenting and until next time. God bless you. Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth says, bye bye. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross, this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Accept what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt, so hell won't befall. 
go to the foot of the cross this day. His precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross. Without our Savior, we're total loss.